Well, this morning, we welcome you back. I know some of you have been on spring break, and some of you may still be 50% on spring break, uh, but we're glad you're here today. Thank you for being with us in worship this morning. We welcome our friends in Building A who are worshiping along with us and those on the uh, radio as well as online today. So we're glad that you're with us. However you are joining us today, we're glad that you are part of this gathering this morning. Well, we're going to open our Bibles in a moment to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I do hope you're planning to make your way back tonight for our night of worship um, as uh, Brian and the choir and orchestra lead us in worship together on this uh, evening as we're kind of preparing for Easter too. So there's some things happening along the way, but <clears throat> we'll be talking about that in just a few moments. But Second Peter chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse... Uh, Well, let's start in about verse 3. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the word, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Would you bow your heads and pray with me for a moment, please? Father, there is so much before us in this, and I pray that you will give us grace as we work through these verses over the next uh, week or so. As we open your word today, we do pray that you will speak into our hearts the word that we need to hear this morning, whatever that may be. We don't know where that will come from or how that will uh, land in our lives, but I pray that we will not walk away from this time together unchanged because the promise of your word is that it does not return to you void. It will accomplish that for which it has been sent out. So I pray that will be so today in this room and among the people who are listening this morning. Father, as we gather, we know we do not come uh, without our problems and issues and circumstances that sometimes even make listening in a church service difficult. But I pray that our hearts will be clear before you this morning, that you may speak by your spirit into those places in our lives where we need to hear your voice this morning. Bring healing to those who are hurting, strength to those who are weak. Um, And as the power of Jesus is, as we just sang about, is felt in this place today, would you bring hearts to the foot of the cross, where they might find new life in Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. I'm going to be honest with you. I uh, <clears throat> got into this text this week, in the past week and a half or so, and tried to press it all into one just real concise message to bring you this morning, and I couldn't do it. 
Um, so I found myself having to basically tear this in half uh, today. I'm going to start this morning. I can't finish it. I will, Lord willing, finish it next week. But, but let me start just with a question. Um, th- this is not, when you hear this, it, this is not a real encouraging, uplifting, inspiring kind of text. Uh, it's actually filled with some warnings and some things that we need to pay very careful attention to. But, uh, but let me ask you just a, a, a real honest question this morning. Have you ever gotten homesick? Maybe you're homesick right now. Yeah, their hands going up. All right, we got people raising their hands. Uh, one little girl said who was at camp, she didn't like it very much being away from mom and dad for the first time, so she called mom at home. And mom said, honey, are you homesick? And she said, no, I'm here sick. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you're just here sick this morning. You know, it's just uh, maybe you're in a place, a situation that's not where you want to be. Maybe you now live in Florida and you didn't want to live in Florida. You didn't see yourself ever living here. I got, I got here sick, I guess you would say, uh, on a plane flight from Addis Ababa to Austria a couple of weeks ago. Um, ended up in a seat beside a very scary little lady um, who I had oddly already encountered in the, in the airport terminal buying a, a, a bottle of water and she came up behind me and was literally pushing me forward. I'm, I'm paying for my water. I'm thinking, what is she wanting me to do? She didn't speak English. But she had prison tattoos. Those communicate across cultures. You know, she had prison tattoos on her hands, going up her neck. So I didn't say anything to her. I just, I just looked at her and just went back to my business. And, of course, I ended up seated beside her on the flight for the next eight hours. So she sat down beside me and... and uh, and I tried really hard just not to move. I thought, I'm not going to look at her. I'm just, I'm just going to sit here and, and try not to do anything, you know, too quickly. Um, things went along okay. In fact, I kind of relaxed because, I, you know, again, I don't know what she, which language she was listening in, but the movie that she had, that she was playing Adam Sandler movies all the way back in the trip. So I thought, well, she can't be too bad. But then, like in the middle of the flight, and I didn't, I was half asleep when she did it, she, she, she just got up out of her seat, turned around, and just took off, just started screaming at the man behind her in some language I did not understand. And, uh, you know, she was just, but I knew the tone. I thought, this is not a good conversation. And apparently the guy behind her understood. And uh, I thought, I'm going to end up in this scuffle, you know, this international incident on an airplane. I just wanted to be home. You know, I was 24 hours on a plane from home. And I just, it's just one of those moments I hadn't had since I was a child. I just thought, I just want to be home so bad. I just want to be in. And and what is it that makes home home? Is it a feeling of safety? Well, I know at least if I'm home, I'm safe. Uh, Security, you know. How about familiarity? It's just great, isn't it, to walk into a house, into a room, you know where the light switch is, you know, you know where stuff you, you threw on the floor is still laying there, you know how to get around it, and, you know, it's, it's home. It's home. What, what is it? Just think for a moment. What is it that makes home, home? And I think it's strange, as Christians, that we refer to heaven as home when none of us have been there. Well, I'm speaking for myself. I haven't been there. Maybe some of you have, but I, I've never made it. I've not seen heaven. Um, and there's really nothing familiar about it. Even when we read about it in scripture, say Revelation 4 and 5, we read this beautiful picture of worship around the throne of God, but that doesn't feel familiar But we call heaven home. And and my experience is it's not just Christian people who do that. Everyone says, well, when somebody dies, what do we, well, they went home. Implying, well, something like heaven, they went there. Um, We have gospel hymns that talk about going home to our mansion 
over the hilltop. Uh, we sing those at funerals. But I think we get the picture wrong. You know, we all long for home. That's built into every one of us. The book of Ecclesiastes says eternity is in the heart of man. We, we long for eternity, but we long for home. And there's something in us that causes everything on this planet, everything, every joy, every relationship, every satisfaction, every meal, every sunset, every sunrise, they're all beautiful, but there's still something that just doesn't quite satisfy us. Because we're longing for home. We just want to be home. And everything, every joy on this planet really points to something better that goes beyond where we are right now. Paul describes it as better by far. I truly believe the day's coming when we're going to experience the fullness of what home means, the satisfaction that we long for now, but we don't have. But here's what I'm going to say this morning. That place will not be unfamiliar to us. Now, here's the most controversial thing I'm bringing into this message series and, and I'm planning it toward the end of my time here, so that way if you get mad at me, you, you know, that's fine. But, but, but let, me just, let me just tell you, let me take away from you the idea that you're going to spend eternity floating around somewhere up in some ethereal place in the sky, some cruise ship in the sky for eternity. You're going to, listen, you're, you're going to live on, in, in a place, a physical place. In fact, the same globe that you're living on right now is where we're going to spend eternity. And God is going to be here with us. Now, the book of Genesis calls that place Eden. Eden. But the book of Revelation that we looked at a couple of weeks now the end of the book of Revelation takes us back to God's fulfillment of Eden as heaven comes down to earth. Now, this is such a change of thought. I know it just throws some of us really off because we kind of thought we're going to get fitted for angel wings and go, you know, flapping around up in the sky. And that's what heaven's going to be. No, it's not. It, it, let, me, let me talk about that just a little bit today. And I'm just trying to, I'm pushing us a little into our discomfort zone with this, but I'm, I'm going to justify it. I'm going to explain it as we go along. And I don't want you to miss this part. God's plan is to bring into existence, look at verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's God's plan. To bring about a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. All things, everything now, everything you see now is going to be destroyed so that all things could be made new. God's going to remake Eden, not just in one locale, but the whole universe is going to be Eden. And he's going to dwell with his creation in a perfect world and a perfect universe unmarked by rebellion and sin. His original plan here on earth with us. That's the plan. And we who trust Jesus Christ will be living in this new heaven and new earth. You know, when we moved here over 30 years ago, I stayed in Florida after Pam and the kids went back to Kentucky to get us ready to move. I stayed to buy a house. Not always a great idea to leave the husband behind to buy a house, but I stayed to buy a house. And and I looked diligently and we finally found a place. And when we found the place, signed the contract on it. I came back, got my 30-pound video camera out of the back of my car, put it on my shoulder like a TV reporter, and walked through the new house, and videotaped all the different spots, the rooms, the closets, everything, cabinets, hallways. And then I drove through the neighborhood with my camera on my shoulder, you know, and, and I, I wanted them to see, you know, the streets and the houses around and the, where we we're going to be and what it looked like and, because it was this brand new place for us that we hadn't seen before. And then I drove all night on Tuesday 
and arrived home early Wednesday morning and we immediately, early in the morning, got up, gathered around the TV set and put in the video. And we looked at the pictures of our new home. Not just once. Several times. Play it again, Dad. Let's watch it again. Let's watch it again. Terrible video. <laughs> but it had everybody's attention. Why? Home. It was home. Seeing a little bit through a video camera was enough to give us hope and keep us energized through a move over the Christmas holiday from Kentucky to Florida. So the Bible gives us these pictures. That it gives us these vignettes, these shots, these little pictures. There's no way that my video captured the fullness of our new home and new place we were living, a new neighborhood and new people. It didn't capture all that. It gave us a little shot, but with that little shot, it gave us hope. We've got a place to go. There's a home waiting. There's a place waiting. And listen, that's the hope you need today. You may never have named that, but that's the hope every person needs today. Where's home? Where's home? So the three things that Peter tells us in this text that are really important, I want us to understand that when we get toward the end of the Bible in 2 Peter, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, James, Hebrews, by, by the latter years of the, of the New Testament writing, persecution had become institutionalized in Rome. It was legal, legitimate to persecute Christians. And they were. But the things that we're reading in these passages were given to these persecuted believers who were being crucified by the hundreds and thousands, who were being set on fire, covered in pitch, who were being thrown to animals in the arena, who were losing everything they had, losing their homes, their possessions. And, and what does the Bible give them? It gives them a picture. This is what's coming. And you know what? It was enough to sustain them. And it's enough to sustain you. But we've got to see this clearly. We've got to understand what's really being said. So Peter gives us a different angle. We talked about heaven a couple of weeks now. Peter gives us a different angle of thinking about how did, we, how did it get here? What, how did this happen? So, so we're going to look again in, in this week and next in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to talk about, uh, here's three things I want to just give you this morning. This real quick. Number one, I want you to see that this place that's coming, this new heaven, this new earth, it's, it's a perfect place. It's a perfect place. It's physical, but it's perfect. And the, the, this, this idea of a new perfect place that has come is not, it's not a new idea. Isaiah the prophet spoke of this at the end of the book named for him. The last two chapters speak of this new creation, Isaiah 65 and 66, that was in the heart and the mind of God to bring to reality at the end of time. Every time somebody comes to Jesus, every time somebody is made new in Christ, and folks, we need to celebrate this a lot more than we do. A baptism is important because it reminds all of us that there's a new world coming. There's a new place. There's a new, we have a new creation in Christ. We, we have a person who's been made new in Jesus and they have a new home in heaven waiting and a new earth and a heaven that's coming. The resurrection is so important to get right. In fact, it's the most important thing. Jesus was called the first fruits of the new creation, a kind of guarantee or down payment or promise of more that was coming. Now, here's, here's what we also get wrong. When Jesus was resurrected, he was physically resurrected. He walked on the earth for 40 days. But when he was resurrected, he was resurrected to the earth, to a physical place, not to heaven. He didn't just shoot up to heaven. He did that 40 days after the resurrection. But for 40 days, he walked on planet Earth. He was hugged by his friends. He was held by those who loved him. He shared meals. He ate fish. Obviously, he was on the Mediterranean diet. And he was showing them that, that he was flesh and blood. The disciples sat around him as he did this fish fry on the beach, and he ate fish, and they looked at him, and they thought, 
You're not a ghost. You're real. You're flesh. You're blood. You're physical. Yes. And in eternity, you're not going to just float around, the, you know, float above the ground six inches. You're going to hug. You're going to be embraced. You're going to see and eat and be all the things that Jesus showed us in himself in the 40 days after the resurrection. Again, Jesus was raised to earth, not to heaven. He ascended to heaven, but he was resurrected on earth. And in the same way that the physical body of Jesus was placed in the grave and the same body came out three days later, listen, the new heavens and the new earth are going to be a physical place that what we're describing in 2 Peter is here's, they're going to die, but then they're going to be resurrected to a new heaven and a new earth, just like Jesus was resurrected. His resurrection was a fulfillment of prophecy and a promise of more to come. I don't know if you think about that much. Johnny Erickson, uh, Tara, wrote about the resurrected body in this wonderful book she wrote on heaven. She said, can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives somebody spinal cord injured like me? Or somebody who's cerebral palsied or brain injured or who has MS. Imagine the hope this gives to somebody who's manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, minds, and hearts. Only in the gospel of Jesus Christ do hurting people find such incredible hope. And all that gets lived out on a new earth. Now think about that a moment. Everything wrong with your body right now? Can you make a list? It's all going to be gone. New body, new place to live. It's a perfect place. It's a purified place. You know, there's a lot of people who believe that what we're reading about in 2 Peter is, is describing God is going to come at the end of time and just completely obliterate everything. Like an artist taking a, a painting that he didn't like and just wadding it up and throwing it away and saying, I'm going to start over again with something new. That's not what God's doing. That's not what this text is saying. What it's describing is a purification process like a refiner purifies metal. The word dissolve that's used in 2 Peter chapter 3 actually means to be laid bare, to be exposed, to be seen for what it is. So what we're seeing here is a purification of everything that remains of sin and death and the evidence of the fall. All of that's going to be wiped away as God brings a purifying fire into the universe. Now, here's, here's the thing. We don't have to worry about blowing ourselves up with a nuclear cataclysm. Number one, we don't have enough firepower to blow up the whole universe. So that's not going to happen. We're not going to blow ourselves up in a nuclear war. We're not going to, we're not going to burn ourselves down with global warming, and we're not going to die in a zombie apocalypse. But what is going to happen is promised here. God is going to bring a fire like he brought a flood in the days of Noah. The purpose of the flood was to purify the world. The purpose of the fire will be to purify the world, the universe, and everything that's in it. Because God is going to come and dwell with us. Now, God's not mad at the universe. He's not mad at the stars and the planet. But Everything that God created was polluted by sin because of man's fall. And this brings back the purification. This brings back the sinless state that God initially created man to be in and all of us to live in so that he could dwell with us. That's what the plan is. God wants to be with man. We get this wrong. We think, we, we think the whole plan is how quick can we get off the earth? How quick can we get out of the thing that we're messed up in right now? How quick can we get out of here? We think about, Christians think about, you know, we think about the rapture and, you know, God's going to come take us out. Listen, here's the deal. All throughout the Bible, through the, through the creation, through the incarnation of Jesus, through the tabernacle, through the temple, through the, 
through the resurrection and, and finally through what we're reading about in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, everything in the Bible says God is trying to get back onto the planet Earth. We're trying to get off of it. We got something wrong. God wants to live with us. He wants to be with us on this planet. And that's his plan. Right now we live in a creation that groans as in the pains of childbirth, waiting for that day to come. But he's going to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. But finally this, let me finish up with this. It's a promised place. It's a promised place. Acts 3.21 tells us that Christ will remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. God, listen, here's the promise. God is going to restore everything. See, you're going to live. I don't, how many of you have been to Hawaii? Beautiful, right? Come on, you've seen it? Okay. As pretty as it was, I went over there. I, it was okay. I mean, it was all right. I live in Florida. I'd soon stay in Florida, but that's, that's me. But we went. It was great. But here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the most beautiful sight you have ever seen on planet Earth. Whatever that is, a mountain, an ocean, vista, whatever, whatever it is. The most beautiful sight you've ever seen. And then remember something. That's broken. I'll tell you what, I want to see Hawaii. I want to see Hawaii when, it, when God fixes it. When God restores it to the way that he intended it to be from the beginning. Think about that for a moment. Everything, no matter what you've seen that's so beautiful, you think, oh, it's beautiful. And there are beautiful things on earth. There's no question. But they're tinted and they're tinged and they're dingy because of sin. And God is going to come and restore his creation. He's not mad at his, he wants his creation to be what he wanted it to be from the beginning. You know, when God, when the Bible says in the book of Genesis 1 and 2, when he's talking about creating the, everything, and he looked at it and he said, it's good. Do you know what that word really means? You know what he said? The word is tob in Hebrew. You know what, he, what it means? He looked at it, he looked at everything, and he said, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. God created a beautiful universe. We destroyed it with sin. But the day's coming, and, and here's the last point I wanna make. Scoffers, 2 Peter chapter 3 said, scoffers have asked throughout the years, where's the promise of his coming? You talk about Jesus coming. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, Peter said. They've asked, where's this promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's not true. The flood came. And Peter reminds him of that. But then he goes on and he says this in verse 8, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. He's not slack, some translations say. He's not slack. He's not slacking off. He's not forgotten about it. He's patient toward us. One, on Friday, uh, Mikhail asked her mom how to spell Terry. Terry. And, and Logan knew that Mikhail was writing a story about a cat. And she thought she got some word wrong. So she said, well, use, use the word in a sentence. And so Mikhail said, you know, cats are slow. So they tarry behind. You know, kid's so smart, we have to ask her definitions for the words she's using now. So The Lord is not tarrying behind. He's patient. He's patient. Look at why. Not wanting any to perish, but all to come. 
He doesn't want, he doesn't want to lose anyone. You know why? Because he created you and you are beautiful. God said so. Now, your loved one may disagree. But God said, no, you're beautiful. You may disagree. So I don't think I'm beautiful. The one who made you said you are. You're beautiful. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. God made you tov, beautiful. And he doesn't want to lose you. And so why is it taking so long, 2,000 years now, for Jesus to return? Well, I know this. Waiting time is not wasted time. God is not wasting time. He is giving opportunity for every person to come to repentance who will come. You know, we get time wrong. We think, and, and our language betrays this, we think time moves forward. We think time moves forward. And when you're listening to a sermon, you think it, yeah, it moves really slowly. We just changed our clocks last week. We moved forward one hour last week. We, we think in terms of time and calendars and years and clocks moving forward, when in reality, folks, let me give you a very cold splash of water in your face this morning. In reality, it doesn't move forward. You are on a countdown. By the time you get out of this service, 60 minutes of your life will be gone. It's clicking. Not going forward. It's moving to a point. The Bible does say, your days are numbered. Teach us to number our days, Lord. Teach us to be wise enough to understand we've got a limited number of days to do what we're going to do. And the clock's ticking. Not forward. Backward. And one day it stops. And that day is going to come when Christ returns once and for all. He will come like a thief, Peter tells us, unexpected, unannounced. So there's a day coming when time stops. And on that day, it's going to be too late to repent. It's going to be too late to believe in Jesus. It's going to be too late to become part of God's plan for his new creation. Too late to escape his judgment of the world. Listen. Everybody doesn't go. This is the biggest lie we believe about heaven. Oh, well, everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. No, you're not. You can choose not to go. Well, how do I do that? By choosing not to receive Jesus as Savior. You're choosing not to go. It's your choice. See, as Lewis said, at the end of time, God is going to say, not his will, but yours be done. Your will, you chose. Your choice. And the clock's ticking. Today's not too late. Today, the opportunity is there if you don't know Jesus Christ. He's made a way for whoever will come, but some, some will reject him. Some will never come to terms with his claim on their life. But the Lord is going to stop time one day. And that'll be it. Listen, for those of you who trust Jesus, who know Jesus, home's on the way. There's, there's a new world. There's a new home coming. Just look through the lens. You can see it in Scripture. And God wants everybody to be a part of that. And today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, we're going to give you an opportunity right now to walk forward and say, I, I, want, I don't understand all this, but I, I do want to, to, to be a part of what God is doing. And I'm ready, I'm ready to give my heart to Jesus. I'm ready to trust him as my Savior. I'm ready to ask him to take my sins away. 
And if you want to do that today, this is your opportunity. We're going to stand together. Brian's going to come and lead us in an invitational song. And while we're singing this response, this is your time to come and say, I want Jesus as my Savior. Would you come and would you do that today? Let's stand together and you come as God leads you now.